recap here. Uh, you know, uh, talked uh, this morning about uh, the importance of uh, operation center, getting that cleaned up, getting your um, getting your field boundaries and guidance lines and machine settings and things like that. Um, previous class we talked about Gen four, um, some some basic. Uh, basic stuff in their uh, settings and operational qualities of that display. Uh, with this class, we're going to go through auto track implement guidance, uh, passive guidance system, turn automation auto pass. So it's maybe an in-depth look here at the automation 4.0 activation. So taking that next step uh, with, uh, with the automation levels we can do with, uh, with tractors and whatnot here. So. With that, here we'll, we'll get started. So, uh, some of the objectives here for uh, the Auto Track Implement Guidance, we're gonna I'm gonna try to explain the overall system theory of operation function for each component, certain the compatible configurations with the system, explain uh, implement receiver installation, and describe receiver shared signal functionality. Compare the differences between passive implement guidance and active implement guidance and describe how advanced uh, guidance settings to fine tune the system. So looking at an overview of the system, so auto track implement guidance, passive implement guidance system, uh, we put a globe on the on the planter. Um, so we're going to improve our pass to pass accuracy. Now that globe on the planter is going to uh, be on the line. The tractor is allowed to steer off the line. And we'll go go through some of the scenarios with that. Um, but you know, looking at uh, you know, if we're doing maybe a fall uh, nutrient application, um, this is going to give us that uh, pass to pass accuracy potentially we're looking for um, to get those seeds on those nutrients. You know that we maybe fall applied in in a in a strip till scenario. So just a quick depiction here. So without auto track implement guidance, um, you know, we can see the that without the the tractor is uh, trying to steer on the line and of course the 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 planter drafts off the line. You know, it's it's being pulled by the tractor at hitch length is quite a ways back there, especially on a lot of our DB planters. Um, and so therefore, you know, we get uh, guess rows that are, are quite a ways off. We're at, with auto track implement guidance now, that planner is steering the tractor off the line to keep itself on the on the line. So, um, auto track implement guidance. So, uh, fairly simple system here requirements um we're going to have that gen 4 display in cab uh we're going to have that receiver rtk receiver on the on the tractor and then we're we're going to mount a receiver on the planter um so pretty simple system whereas with um just active implement guidance our our active steering system we have a Hydraulic controller that's that's actually steering a set of um, typically hydraulic controlled steerable axle or maybe a steerable hitch on the planter. This this system being a passive system is uh, really the globe. So we'll look at some of those components. So we do need that integrated um, integrated auto track steering system. We'll need that display Gen four. 4600 or 4640 universal again can't use that 4240 display we need that implement guidance activation or the the gen 4 automation 4.0 activation we can use 3000 or 6000 receivers and then um, you know with the shared coverage we'll talk about in a minute here um, we can put that sf1 on the implement uh, SF2, SF3, or RTK uh, receiver, and then we need that uh, implement receiver mast, and then 
most likely just, you know, for a lot of CCS planters, uh, we're going to need an implement receiver harness tied into the CAN bus system um, to allow that receiver to communicate. So uh, some of the components that, uh, you know, the, of course, this won't work with the old Starfire, the ITCs, the 2600s, 2630s, um, the old command centers, uh, and we can't use an in, or a universal uh, ATU um, or an auto track control. We need that auto that integrated auto track steering system. So some of the uh, some of the components there. Some system constraints. Um, so we don't want to use it with tow between air carts because of that that uh, that implement is trailing behind uh, the uh, the cart. So it, it's just a, a not a practical solution for that situation. Uh, three pound, uh, excuse me, three point mounted implements. So if we were to use it on a three point. You can imagine that uh, if that globe shifted off, the tractor is going to try to correct and pretty soon you, you're just going back and forth. Uh, it gets a little too aggressive on a, on a mounted implement. Uh, Baylor's mowers, mower conditioners, and then front mounted implements uh, are not approved. Um, so cropping practices. So um, we don't want to use it in standing row crop application. This is a um, passive auto track implement guidance is a a passive system it's going to steer that tractor off the line we don't want to be using it in standing uh, applications uh, bedded crops and then uh, field conditions that are you know extremely rough terrain or wet soils is, it's it's going to complex you know the situation is going to get a little complex and tough to operate Looking at some receiver compatibility, so uh, originally when this uh, slide deck was built, uh, 6,000 to 3,000 was not compatible. Uh, the point here is as long as we've got the latest software updates, which would be uh, it's 450p on a 6,000 and uh, 3.80 on the uh, on the 3,000, they uh, it really doesn't matter. 3,000, 6,000, which one's RTK? We do, we do need the RTK on the on the machine. Uh, we'll look at that in the next slide. So compatibility amongst receivers uh, is pretty pretty simple there. Um, so looking at accuracy levels, and again, uh, we're going to run shared signal with this system. So we now um, we now can put a minimum of SF2 on the machine. And then if we put an SF1 on the implement, our overall system will be SF2. If we put RTK on the machine, whatever level of accuracy that we put on the implement will make both receivers RTK. Um, if uh, if you run iGUIDE, the, the passive steering system of the past in the 2630, 2600s, um, we had to run an RTK on the machine and an RTK on the implement. Uh, that was the only way the system would work. So um, with this, with the Gen 4 auto track implement guidance, uh, we're able to reduce the cost there. Potentially, we've got an SF1 receiver we can use, and now we're, uh, you know, we're putting that on the implement and overall system we're getting RTK. So um, reduced, you know, potentially reduced costs there if uh, we don't have that extra RTK receiver like we needed in the past. So looking at some setup here, um, so the uh, the implement receiver installation. So we can get a mast uh, from John Deere. This happens to be a, a depiction picture of a, of a CCS with a refuge tank. Um, we can get the receiver uh, mounted in the middle if we have a non-refuge uh, tank. We have a lot of customers that will potentially make their own mast. Um, these masts are uh, are not uh, not inexpensive from John Deere. Um, so uh, we've had a lot of customers make their own mast. Um, some things to keep in mind if you if you are doing that, um, I like to uh, 
with the planter in in ground in normal operating uh, mode uh, lowered. Uh, probably want that receiver uh, flush with the receiver on the tractor. Um, we don't want uh, that receiver mounted. Uh, it's recommended to mount the receiver less than 13 feet above the ground, so we don't want it too high um, in in uh, in the operational state. So we just keep that in mind if we're if we're building masts and stuff. Uh, so looking at the at the shared signal uh, icon, and I, I kind of covered this in the previous class, but uh, anyway, we're going to go into our main menu uh, into applications. Um, we're going to click on our auto track guidance. And then uh, once we're in auto track guidance, we're going to hit the uh, that setup arrow in the in the top and then uh, That'll take us into our, our guidance uh, settings. And then you can see the uh, the shared signal. We're gonna, we're gonna activate the shared signal for this system to work. And then uh, we're also gonna activate the auto track implement guidance uh, button within those settings too. And that's uh, that's really all there is to enabling the system once we've installed that receiver and plugged it in and it is communicating on the on the with the display and such looking at some best practices machine measurements so um we want to measure while the machine and implement are in a straight line and then like i say in an operating position so we want that planner lowered you know in ground at normal working height um, and make those measurements. So uh, right now with the, the ground being kind of solid, it's it probably not a good time to be, be doing that. This is gonna be a, you know, an in-field situation. Measure implement dimensions with the implement at working height and then measure in a horizontal or vertical direction. Do not measure diagonally or, or, or at an angle unless instructed to do so. And uh, so typically we want to drop, you know, straight down from that receiver, you know, get that inline distance from hitch pin to receiver. And then likewise with our uh, receiver offset from our, our fixed axle on our implement to uh, to the uh, the receiver center point. So in, in looking at uh, doing those measurements off off the receiver so we have a 6000 3000 so uh, we still have that uh, lip there that where the yellow and green meet on the 3000 that's going to be our height measurement so we're going to measure from that point and, and that will be our height on a uh, on 3000 um I have an arrow kind of depiction on the back there but we kind of look straight forward. There's a there's a little notch or triangle on the front of a 6,000 receiver, right there at the grab point. Um, we measure straight down. You know, hook the tape measure there. You can measure straight down from that. That'll give us our height. And then, um, you know, as far as four and a half goes, the uh, uh, John Deere put that little notch on the 6,000 receivers in the middle there. The little notch that kind of sticks out that's going to be our four aft so if we can measure from that that'll give us our four aft and then of course on the older 3000s um we kind of measure where that you know center of the receiver maybe above that trademark symbol or the e there you know we just want to get as close as we can to the center to get our four aft there's no real marking indicator there like there is on the on the 6000. So in the implement receiver, we are going to input that, you know, that height that we measured and then the depiction in the picture here are four aft setting. So receiver happens to be in front of the, uh, the planter wheels in this scenario. So we're, uh, we're, you know, 
roughly 80 inches they're depicting here. Not sure if that measurement is accurate, but that's uh, that's what we're looking at there. We're we're putting that that information in. So one of the things uh, I know uh, I've, I've told many customers. So uh, with active implement guidance, um, we we don't typically put the fore aft in. With auto track implement guidance, the passive system, the actual implement receiver fore aft distance. Uh, should be entered into the implement receiver VT page. Um, since it's a passive system, the actual distance is there to optimize the overall performance. So, um, so we want to make sure that we're uh, we're putting that in. So, a little review, I guess, between the two systems. Um, so, uh, you know. John Deere likes their acronym, so auto track implement guidance. Uh, the passive system, uh, it, is, it is a passive system. The tractor steers off the line to maintain implement tracking. Uh, it's there to increase pass to pass accuracy, typically used in first pass operations in a planter operation. And then we do input that actual implement receiver for aft value. Whereas with our active implement guidance where we have that app controller it's tied in with the hydraulic system we have you know a hydraulic steerable hitch or steerable axles on the on the implement that becomes an active system we're actively controlling and steering that implement um, utilizes implement steering mechanism to maintain tracking again it increases pass to pass accuracy and this system is used in first pass and subsequent pass because now we're not steering the tractor off the line. The tractor is is steering the the uh, implement is steering. They're both both steering down that line, and then that implement receiver for aft value is set to zero when we're when we're running that active system. Looking at some adjustments, so um, one of the things with with auto track implement guidance. So as auto track implement guidance first operated, uh, the system kind of monitors how the implement drafts behind the tractor. So over time, you know, auto track implement guidance kind of self learns how the implement drafts and optimizes tractor steering to better keep the implement on the guidance line. Um, so it, it's important to make two or three passes in the field allow the system to kind of self learn and adjust and then evaluate that that performance and then we go in and, and make those manual adjustments as needed so in looking at those manual adjustments you know i, I talked a little bit about this in the previous class but um you know now we can go in and make those steering adjustments and you know implement steering you know maybe our slope sensitivity and depending upon slope and and the response rate there with the with the implements. So, um, you know, if, if we're not seeing the performance that we want out of it, now we can make those manual adjustments after we've potentially made a few passes and measured guess rows and, and kind of seen how it how it's tracking and what it's doing for us. So that that's what we got for the auto track implement guidance. We're gonna move on to uh, the auto track turn automation um, so we'll look at some uh, we'll look at some objectives here we'll uh, explain overall system theory and operation function of each component uh, the itech sequences with turn automation uh, uh, speed automation functionality uh, compatible configurations with the system um, process to uh, activate the speed automation and describe uh, advanced uh, settings and how to fine tune the system and describe uh, expected operation of turn automation performance behavior with uh, the other systems like we just talked about auto track implement guidance potentially active implement guidance and section control hey dale if i could just pause you for one second there you do have one question in the chat there uh, from okay. brad t um, I can certainly read it to you if you want me to. Yeah, I can. Current uh, search be on the tracker. So recording source should be 
uh, recording source is still going to be the planter. So we're still uh, with with that question that that Brad so Brad asked uh, implement mountain globes recording source beyond the tractor or the planter. Our recording source is still going to be in our our setup of uh, of the display. So when we put measurements in for said implement um, those offsets uh, those offsets that we put in the implement as far as how far our our record work point in the Gen 4, that's where our recording source is going to be uh, is with the implement and that's that that our work point is going to command our section control on and off. So even though we're putting the globe on the planter, um, it doesn't really change how we set up our recording source and uh, and our uh, our section control that is that is still set up the same as we would have done in the past. So hopefully that can hopefully that answers that question, I guess. So, so uh, an overview um, overview of auto track turn automation here. So uh, what we're looking for with uh, auto track turn automate so accurate end of pass turns. Uh, you know we, we there's some difficulty in repeating that throughout the workday. Uh, I myself uh, uh, do a, a little of rotor beater work for, for the neighboring farm and and you know you, you can see when that planter sometimes comes in uh, you know a little crooked you know you get a, a guess roll a little off in the in the beats so um, you know creating that you know after you've seeded a you know five six hundred acres it uh, the turns don't get uh, are not always uh, the same. So with auto track turn automation, we have that repeatability with turns. Uh, we can we can automate that turn. Uh, we can also you know change speed, raise and lower implements, uh, and, and command the tractor to do uh, different things uh, that we needed to do to to uh, uh, complete that turn. So. So some things with auto track turn automation. Uh, um, you know, setting it up, uh, we can, uh, on top of controlling the tractor speed and turning, um, it uses the implement management system, uh, or ITEC, Intelligent Total Equipment Control System, to automatically control the implement uh, during the end row turns. So, some of the things we can do, engine speed, you know, MFWD on the tractor, diff block, PTO, we can you know, command rear hitch, SCVs, um, different things like that. So, you know, auto track implement guidance combines all the function of the tractor implement, GPS, Gen 4 display, you know, the integrated auto track, you know, it uses the field boundaries, ITEC, and uh, ties that all those systems together um, to help us complete that turn. So. Some system requirements. So um, you need an auto track turn automation compatible tractor. We'll look at that in the next slide. We need that integrated uh, steering system. Still need that Gen 4 4600, 4640 with that uh, that uh, 40 automation activation. And the, you know we need that 4600 with the V2 processor. Kind of talked about that in the last class. 3,000, 6,000 receivers compatible. We uh, we can use SF1 or higher accuracy levels. All that's needed is uh, an SF1 on the tractor uh, for this system to work. So you know we can think about the tillage applications and things like that, where we can you know do turn automation in uh, potentially in a, uh, you know a nine R pull on a cultivator type scenario. Uh, again, we need that auto track turn automation activation, which is the Gen or automation 4.0 and then we'll need a tractor implement automation activation uh, we'll talk about that here in the next couple slides so so compatible tractors uh, we can go back to the uh, eight uh, the 30 series eights and the 30 series nines and then uh, model year 12 and newer six r's 
uh, with the Auto Power IVT uh, model year 11 and newer 7Rs. E23, you know, IVT power, Auto Power. Uh, model 10, model year 10 and newer 8Rs, RTs and AR, RXs. And uh, model year 12 or newer 9Rs, 9RTs, 9RXs. So those are the compatible uh, tractors that we can run. Um, Auto track uh, turn automation on. So, uh, compatible implements, so rear mounted or towed uh, row crop planters, rear mounted or towed tillage or fertilizer implements, uh, small grain seeding equipment, uh, so our, our air seeders and things of that nature, single frame air carts and drills. And uh, and the, the tow behind air carts. Notice that tow between air carts are not listed. Um, you know, it's it's not a a compatible uh, deal. We we talk about that, I guess, in the next slide here. So some system constraints. Uh, tow behind air cart or excuse me, tow between air carts. Not compatible front mounted implements. Um, multiple implements pulled in a series. Uh, where the workpiece is not connected directly to the tractor. Um, pivoting frame mo mowing equipment, so like mocos and stuff, um, you know, that, that pivot from side to side, we're not able to run the turn automation. And then um, one of the things uh, they talk about is standing row crop applications. Um, potentially this, uh, um, you know, I think they're just thinking about running over crop I, I look at it from a standpoint of if I can have I'm I'm running over crop if I can repeat that you know in a row crop cultivation if I can repeat that turn can you know in multiple passes um, I'm not damaging any more um, so um, you know that that's kind of in the eye of the beholder I guess of how you want to look at that so. So the uh, the integrated uh, IMS on the 30 series and the iTech, uh, we're we're kind of we're turning those off. We'll turn those sequences on in ATA. So on the tractor vintage is uh, using Gen 4 4640 display. The integrated tractor implement management system in iTech must be turned off in the tractor's command center uh, to use the auto track turn automation. Um, if the operator chooses uh, the integrated system functionality instead of uh, instead in the command center, uh, ETA and ITEC must be turned off uh, in the in a universal display. So, so uh, equipment dimensions um, are critical in this, um, as they are in in most scenarios. Uh, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, equipment dimensions, uh, you know, for, for recording source and, and setting up some of these other things. Um, but uh, again, with uh, with auto track turn automation, we want to make sure we've got, you know, all our dimensions or offsets, uh, you know, uh, implement widths and such so that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we're not uh, not wrapping an implement around a tire or anything like that. So equipment dimensions are are critical and need to be set up uh, within the system. Um, in talking this morning, you know, with with the Gen 4 or excuse me, with the operation center and getting those uh, field boundaries in there. So in order to run auto track turn automation, we do need that. Oh, excuse me. We do need that um, exterior boundary that is required, and then that exterior headland boundary is required. So we're we're generating that headland boundary off our exterior boundary. Typically, uh, that can be a uh, a numeric number. If I'm running a DB44 and I make two passes, potentially that headland boundary is 88 feet off the exterior boundary. We do have we can put optional passable or passable interior boundaries, impassable interior boundaries, and then we can out we can put a interior headland around those boundaries potentially. So those are those are all optional, not needed, but we do need that 
exterior boundary and that headland boundary. So looking at the uh, some of the with you know with the headland boundary, we can see that that headland boundary is going to be where we start the turn. Um, you know that that's where our measurements when we will look at some of that here in the next few slides, but that's uh, that's what we're basing auto track turn automation off of is that uh, that yellow dash line, which is our, our headland boundary. So. Um, it uh, auto track uh, turn automation does not consider the external boundaries when calculating the turn. So if we do put parameters in there where, hey, I want to make a huge turn, it will turn out into the you know neighbor's field. Um, it's it's looking at that dotted headland boundary. So we want to make sure that we're you know, giving ourselves enough room between the exterior boundary and the headland boundary and setting this up to to make that turn. We can see here, you know, uh, when operating on, you know, angled headlands, uh, the turn pattern is going to be even need to be even longer to ensure adequate area. Uh, again, you know, Auto track turn automation doesn't look at the exterior boundary, you know. So if, if we don't uh, if we don't give ourselves enough room, you know, on an angle, um, we're uh, we're going to be off in the neighbor's field potentially. So uh, just just keep that in mind. We need to give ourselves enough room to actually uh, make that turn. So looking at some headland sequences. So this is uh, the auto track turn automation main page within the display. Um, we're going to look at uh, some of the, the headland sequences, so the triggers. So this is where we're we're going to set up that that iTech within the display and enter those sequences. So uh, when we, we tap on the headland, we can see it pops up and we can choose enter or exiting headland. And then once we choose that, we can add a sequence and then the next step, and then we can choose a function, you know, whether that's uh, turn the uh, MFWD off or diff lock on and off. Um, you know, we have SCVs and whatnot in here. We can control speed, max engine speed, uh, actual tractor forward speed. So you can set up those sequences um, to your liking. Um, whatever you want the tractor and or implement to do, um, you can set those up and, uh, you know, when entering and exiting headlands. Once we've programmed a sequence, we have, uh, you know, when do we want that sequence to happen? So we can, uh, the allowable distance is negative 100 feet to positive 100 feet. So this is, uh, you know, uh, sequence step ex executes at a distance like it says there. Um, you know, a negative value is going to execute quicker and positive is going to be the last. So the next slide kind of depicts that for us. Um, so when we're entering the headland coming out of the pass, you know, if we want to slow the tractor down, we're going to put a negative um, offset in to slow down, you know, quite a ways before the headland. Um, you know, potentially if we're running section control, we can leave that planter in the ground for a little bit. And so we can have a positive, potentially five or 10 feet, a positive uh, after entering the headland and then lift the planter up so that we make sure, hey, we've seated all the way out to the end, section control shut the planter off. Now we can go ahead and lift it up. Now in setting these up, you know, looking at the exiting the headland, we're turning around back into the pass. You know, we're we're going to put that planter in the ground a little early, so that it, it's in the ground. Section control is going to turn it on for us at that that potentially at that headland boundary uh, where our coverage stopped. And then, um, you know, after we're into the pass, now we can, you know, speed up the tractor and you know any other functions. Turn back. You know, turn our or diff lock back on, things like that, if, if we're utilizing those functions. 
So just keeping in mind that we can put a distance in those sequences and that, you know, the positive and minus uh, kind of change depending upon if you're entering or exiting, uh, how early or late you want that to happen. Uh, maximum speed. So we can see at the bottom we got a max turn speed and a max infield speed. So we're going to set those up. Um, you know, in in when we're setting the system up to do that. So, you know, if we want to, you know, if we're running in an exact emerge planner, let's say eight or ten miles an hour across the field, and we want our max turn speed to be maybe four or five. We're going to put max turn speed of four or five in there and that, that can be changed as uh, you know if, uh, you get more comfortable um and then a max in field speed you know if, if if we're like i say if we're running an exact emerge planner we want that max in field speed to be 10 mile an hour we can set that if, if we're pulling a cultivator that we only want to go say six seven miles an hour or, or less uh, we can set that max in field speed so and then our speed automation is enabled uh, when we hit that auto track resume button, that's gonna that's gonna enable the speed automation portion of the auto track uh, turn automation. So we talked a little bit about this uh, the tractor implement automation activation that also uh, needs to happen. Um, so in the you know 30 series eight 30 series nine. 30 series tractors, early 8Rs and RTs. Um, there's a, we've got to order some software and then download those payloads into uh, the uh, TIA controller. Uh, for later serial numbers, uh, uh, later tractors, um, we just activate it through Stellar support. It is a free activation. So potentially if we're putting it on some of the, the older tractors, um, you know, there, there, there might be a, a cost associated with that for potentially a, a tech or someone to install that software. And then all model year 18 and later. So this is looking at V2 processors, you know, uh, later model tractors, that tractor implement automation is factory installed. So if you have a uh, model year 18 later machine uh, should have that tractor implement automation already installed. Uh, as an activation on the display. So looking at some operations, so uh, the speed automation, um, if the tractor's ground speed is manually changed during uh, an active turn, um, speed automation setting for max turn speed, max in field speed are no longer used. So if we are running an IVT and we, you know, grab the handle or run the scroll wheel that's gonna that's gonna shut off our speed automation um you know operator will be notified in the display um the auto track turn automation will remain active and continue to execute uh, the the guidance or the turn guidance um and the itech functions that we set up um and then to resume the max turn speed or max in field speeds uh, will just depress that, you know, the auto track resume switch to to re enable the, the max speeds. So and then while traveling through the field, you know, if we adjust our speed, um, we'll have to hit the the uh, resume speed uh, or the resume switch again to activate that that those speed settings. So looking at um, going to review, you know, auto track turn automation operation with some other features, um, starting with the uh, auto track implement guidance. So um, the performance of both are optimized to work together um, in approaching a headland boundary uh, and auto track uh, turn automation end of row sequence is triggered. The auto track implement guidance is disabled uh so it does not counteract with the turn automation uh, once the headland exit sequence is completed then auto track implement guidance resumes operation so it, it when we set up that turn we're going to set it up so that that planner comes in 
straight on the gas row where we want it. So not maybe a necessity to have the uh, auto track implement guidance engaged for the auto track turn automation because uh, we're going to design that turn so that it, it works correctly. And the systems don't fight each other. If we're running active implement guidance, um, we're going to use uh, within the app controller that is controlling the hydraulics. We're going to put a check mark in the disengage steering when work recording is off so that it, those two systems do not conflict with each other when uh, automating that turn. So and then looking at section control is kind of a screenshot. <clears throat> excuse me here with uh, the section control advanced uh, operation turned on so we can kind of see the se sections are commanded off and this this would vary depending upon how we have our overlap settings and, and such uh, set up, you know, so depending upon how you have section control set up, uh, this uh, is a depiction of a half width disconnect basically, so half the planner. So uh, just showing sections commanded on and off there. So so that that system uh, works in ta or works together with the with the turn automation. So. Some adjustments with uh, auto track turn automation. So um, it's recommended to use the default settings for initial setup. Um, we provide a start point um, for many of uh, the you know implement configurations, uh, but it uh, it may be necessary to fine tune. So we'll look at a couple of those. So uh, we can see here, you know, uh, we can change our start turn uh, point. So at a minus 20, you know, that depiction is showing here. Uh, we're starting that turn a little early, uh, not using the full headland, and potentially we're getting a, a little gap there, you know, because we're not getting turned around and back into the row where we need to be. Um, nope, excuse me. If we put uh, zero feet in, um, you know, that that might not be enough to get the implement turned around and back on the line where we need to be. So maybe we add a few feet after that headland boundary. Um, they're depicting 20 feet here. You know, that gets that planner turned around, uh, drug back in there straight, and, you know, we don't have any uh, gaps in our guess row. So some some settings there uh, for, the, for that start turn. Uh, Turn aggressiveness setting uh, changes the aggressiveness of the tractor's turn and how it feels to the operator. So the default value is 125. Uh, decreasing the value lessens the aggressiveness, uh, making the turn kind of more gradual. Uh, increasing the value uh, strengthens the aggressiveness, making the turn more sharp. So we can kind of see if we go down to a, a 50 value here, it's uh, pretty lackadaisical, it just kind of bows around there uh, at 125 you know that's kind of the the uh, the guesstimate you know the blue line is going to be the tractor the green line is going to be the implement following around there and then if we if we turn that aggressiveness up we're gonna we're gonna turn quickly we're kind of gonna flatten out and then turn again and flatten out and it, it's uh it just it changes that aggressiveness of the turn you might not get a nice smooth turn you're gonna get kind of a, a turn and then a flatten out and a turn. So just monitoring that turn aggressiveness and and setting it to your, your preference. Uh, some advanced turn settings. So equipment turn, you know, max or excuse me, minimum turn radius and maximum turn angle. And then the uh, speed control for turn deceleration threshold and response aggressiveness. So some additional settings here we'll look at. So minimum turn radius uh, limits how tight the turn can be, uh, not allowing the tractor to turn tighter than the entered value. Um, so uh, note that uh, this this value is typically half the tractor turn diameter. Um, of course, lower results will result in a tighter turn, while higher results will widen that turn. So. Want to make sure we're kind of 
you know, looking at uh, the size of our implement. Um, tractors typically are capable of turning tighter than uh, than um, than the implement can turn. So if we're, you know, pulling a, a DB44 or 6688, you know, large planters, you know, that end wheel, we don't want that pivoting too hard on in the ground there kind of doing, uh, for lack of better terms, a sit spin. So we want to make sure that we're getting the, the right minimum turn radius there. And then our, our maximum turn angle. So how tight the tractor can turn in relation to the implement. Um, this value can be adjusted, of course, to prevent the jackknifing of the implement. Or, you know, if we've got triples installed and such, uh, we can decrease that angle of the turn. Um, you know, wheel tractors, you know, we can turn all the way to lock and typically we're not going to have too much trouble. But, you know, if, we, if we're setting this up on a potentially a T tractor, you know, that 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 thing can do almost a sit spin. So if we put 90 degrees in there, we're going to have a we're going to have a track wrapped around part of an implement. And not a good situation. So setting up that maximum turn angle so that it's uh, not too aggressive is, is going to be the key there. Um, our turn deceleration threshold sets how far the tractor can travel offline during the turn before automation slows the tractor down to help correct the error. So a higher value represents uh, a larger deviation in that tolerance and a lower represents a smaller deviation in that tolerance of, of how far it, it can travel offline before it's going to slow that tractor down to complete the turn correctly. So if we've got our, our turn speed set a little too high, um, it'll, it'll slow that tractor down. And then we have our response aggressiveness. So uh, response aggressiveness within an auto track turn automation uh, um, controls the tractor ground speed changes when entering and exiting the turns. So this value can be adjusted if tractor acceleration or deceleration is too aggressive or too slow. So lower value is going to change uh, speed more gradually and a higher value is going to be pretty aggressive. So we find that once the turn is complete and the tractor aggressively accelerates back to in field speed, uh, we can we can turn that aggressiveness down. Uh, the default is three and typically um, that works pretty well for us, but again, that that can be changed to operator uh, preference. So that's uh, that's uh, auto track turn automation. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to some auto path um, uh, subject matter here. So so auto path uh, is a new feature added to the automation 4.0 activation last year. Um, so uh, used for creating guidance lines using using the actual location of each prop row. So uh, the data data that is documented during source path operation. So uh, when we look at source path operation, uh, typically we're looking at that planter pass. Now we can do a pre-plant the application or row based tillage. So if we're putting down Maybe we would go out with a strip till rig in the fall, or potentially we're um, we're uh, uh, we were going to try a little bit this fall. Didn't didn't get to it, um, <clears throat> but maybe some ridging of, of beet rows. Um, we can potentially use that pass, and then follow that. Use auto path in the planter to uh, to to go on top of those rows. Now, keep in mind here that we do need that planting pass um, to follow with subsequent passes in in the crop season. So as noted here, uh, the pre-plant um, row based tillage cannot be used for subsequent application or tillage passes. So we need that planter pass to follow, you know, uh, we need that planter source pass to uh, follow with the sprayer with the uh, with the combine, um, so on and so forth. The uh, rotobeater, the digger, you know, what, if we're going to generate those auto path lines for those subsequent passes in season, 
it has to be the, the planner pass. Um, some updates with um, model year 22. So with the release of uh, 20, uh, 21 dash three software, which is kind of funny. It actually came out in January, uh, but it was the last software update for 21. Um, they did uh, quite a few auto path updates, so highly recommend that if you are going to run auto path this year uh, and if, if you're running um, um, auto track implement guidance, you've got that globe. Uh, or that receiver mounted on the planter. Um, that's really all we need to do auto path. So uh, we're getting uh, a couple features there, uh, potentially out of that of, out of that automation 4.0 activation uh, with the planter. So one of the updates they did is you can go in and, and check in the uh, in the setup of um, in the work setup. Um, ready to record so last year when we were utilizing this with some customers uh, we put the globe had the globe on the planner receiver on the planner we had really no idea if it was going to record so now we have the not ready to record and then it, it will have a green light uh, if it is in fact ready to record um, so and then to enable that feature, we go into our work setup and put a check mark in that box for enable auto path recording status. So we can put a check mark in there if we're using auto path. And then we'll get the uh, if we click on that source uh, or excuse me, that uh, that icon, uh, we'll be able to see that yes, we do have an implement receiver information is defined, implement receiver is present, accuracy is there, and and then it asks you to verify the fore, aft, and height. So um, we will be able to know that, yes, we will be able to record this because really we only get one opportunity to plant and one opportunity to record that source path data. So it um, getting that uh, getting that right from the the word go is is the key there so um other update to auto path uh, crop type was a problem <coughs> excuse me last year um i know i had some customers with edible beans uh, labeled navies pinks blacks spindles so on and so forth in their documentation auto path would only accept common bean uh, so we had to go in and edit some of that data to common bean in order to get the auto path data to send to the machines or create those auto path files. Um, that is no longer the case. Crop type, uh, crop type does not matter. So we can use uh, whatever crop type um, uh, we want there. Um, another um, point I'd like to make in running auto path last year, uh, had a had a customer that was doing some rotary hoeing uh, with auto path in, in corn and um, of course that's just the tillage pass you do need to set up a product application it, uh, it will not generate the auto path lines uh, unless it's a product application or harvesting so i just uh, to get around that in the system uh, do not know if that's a resolved issue but to get around it i just put in water zero gallons now i have a product application with my tillage uh, we can go in and edit that data data later in the operation center so uh, if you run into that scenario um, potentially you can uh, you can use that that customer was able to run auto path in corn at uh, roughly 15 to 17 miles an hour with that rotary hole and uh, with no issues uh, no corn run over so Auto path was a big win for him. Um, so, in looking at uh, auto path, um, you know, within operation center, so we'll get these. I uh, um, was able to plant soybeans on the TNE 80. Uh, that source path data is there. There was a 1034 application with that, so either one of these would work, but. We got that seeding of soybeans on May 10th. 
uh, we select, you know, the most recent seeding, and then, you know, uh, we can we can generate the AutoPath files from there. Um, so that that's kind of what it looks like in Setup Builder, in uh, in the Operation Center to go ahead and send those files. We're going to go through our fields, select that that seeding um, task. And that has that uh, auto path. You'll notice like the tillage has a red explanation point, so all requirements were not meant to met to record auto path for for that that particular pass. So we select the recent, select the path, and then we create that setup builder. Uh, we're going to include the one field we don't need to send boundaries or guidance. Typically, that's already in the previous setup file. But we can just send those auto path files for multiple fields um, in one shot, you know, typically wireless to to the display. And we have a, a kind of a depiction. Um, we'll get too wrapped up in the photo here. Uh, the sprayer should be on the line, but this is kind of what it will look like on your display. All these yellow lines are basically planted rows. Uh, this is the edge of that field, so I started on the the other side when I planted this field. This is the end. Kind of see there's a little gap there. We planted, you know, some rows, exact emerge planter, so it was just shutting off sections as needed. One thing I would recommend with AutoPath is to kind of start in the same spot you started planting. Uh, you're going to get the best results by doing so. Um, some AutoPath system requirements a lot of the uh, same system requirements um, we need that integrated steering system again the, the 4600 4640 um, display um, the implement uh, potentially implement guidance activation 3000 6000 we need that implement receiver uh, mast on the on the planter and then associated harnesses, uh, implement receiver harness, most likely. So, um, 